Well, I learned when I was in film school, I learned on 16 millimeters. So it was, the, the practice was dual system, recording sound separate than um, image. And then through teachers that I had who had more experimental film practices, there was always this question of what kind of sound, like dynamic qualities you could create by pairing sound and image and like kind of troubling or complicating the idea of of sync sound. And I, in all of my films leading up to this, I played a little bit with like causal rhythms without a, through a piece. So a sound that might sort of match like a micro rhythm of an image that the mind might attach or link to that action in the image, but it's not actually generating that sound. So ventriloquism became a sort of shorthand to think about the relationship of sound and source or cause and effect, which I think is really kind of at the core of experimental filmmaking. And I like playing with that distance between those two things and sort of seeing how tenuous the connection can be um, before they either fall apart or the word the mind might marry them together. In this film, it's sort of self-referential to cinema. Maybe a comment on that relationship that I think is something that so many artists explore. But I really wanted to push sort of the, the objecthood side of an image um, by treating it as something sort of inset within the frame or something that might be scanned and then play with how much life or animacy a sound might then give an image. So it's really playing with sort of dimension and vitality or animacy um, in the pairing. My last few films have gotten more and more modular, and I think it has to do with sort of a collage approach of collecting the sounds and images. Um, and I always sort of choose a mode of capture or creation that I think best suits the subject. Um, some are practical and some are just formal choices. Um, for all of the shots of the woman that we see in profile who's sort of singing but we don't hear her voice, I wanted that on 16 millimeter and I wanted to push it because I wanted that very active surface and grain because the film is thinking about texture. It made a lot of sense to me to then pair that sort of busyness that's on the skin with sort of a slick gloss of computer generated imagery. So something that is very fake and not really, tr or something that kind of accentuates sort of the illusionistic quality of you know the cinema experience or cinematic experience. Um, and then I was looking at YouTube footage because I liked the um, like the, the traveler, the, the tourist, the kind of casual incidental quality of like a cell phone footage. Um, and because all of the text sort of relates about this person, this wanderer who's on a journey, who's looking and who's sort of either seduced or terrified by what they're looking at. So um, the YouTube footage brings in a very different texture that I liked um, as something outside of something that I had created um, to kind of fold in to these other um, very kind of heterogeneous textures that I'd already put into the film. I guess the, the clearest example to talk about with this idea of ventriloquism is we see a woman and she opens her mouth and we would expect to hear a voice, but instead we hear like the high ringing tone um, of a finger rubbing on a wine glass. So I think really playing with the idea that an object is then giving voice to a human and these sort of... Um, kind of upsetting these relationships of inanimate and an animacy. Um, and the film, I think, also feels very disparate and fragmented because it's sort of citing these different points of reference. So there's these lymphonic stones that are in Pennsylvania, and when you strike them with a hammer or with another stone, they sound like a bell because of their geological construction or you know their formation um, so I was really interested of an object that in the natural world actually sounded very different than what you would expect like the sound that comes from it challenges the idea of its material nature 
So I think um, having sound maybe undo an image is really interesting to me. And then sort of rocks and vessels are sort of through lines across these really disparate subject matter. Um, so we see rocks that ring like bells. We see rocks that serve as habitat in uh, an abandoned bear cage. Um, we see fragmented human bodies. We see fragmented statues that are rubbed for good luck. And I think maybe a through line across all these different parts is this idea of touching or touching tied to other senses. Um, and I think maybe synesthesia would be a useful word to think about these things that are kind of twinned or entangled in a way. The first bit of text is from Story of, an o, Story of o, um, which is Pauline Riage. It's from the preface of the book, and I'm actually forgetting who wrote the preface at the moment. I, I apologize. Um, and I liked the idea of using, in this er like famous sort of erotic novel, um, a one passage that's about rocks, um, when, when, it's a, when it's a book that's so much about, about bodies. And, um, and it sort of sets up this narrative that I stitched together of sort of, uh, of, 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 this, like, of this traveler. And then the second bit of text that pairs with the statues is from a website called Roadside America. And it's a blog, and I don't know who wrote it, but it had such a particular sort of kind of perverted and kind of cheeky voice to it. You know, it's like, and it's about this practice of going to statues and like rubbing a toe for good luck or rubbing a nose for good luck. And, um, but it's written in a way that's just like the, the voice is so strange to me. And um, I liked that these sort of non-erotic parts of the statue were being, were being treated sort of fetishistically. So I wanted to have both of those texts on screen and the voice to be implied, and then to have the written language with its own particularities be the thing that came across the most without being kind of tied to a speaking voice. Um, the third bit of text um, is all bracketed, and it's um, sort, of just, sort of riffing off of the um, convention of like described audio or descripti described audio um, for the hearing impaired or someone that doesn't have you know, headphones or you know, a way to access the audio. And it sometimes describes sounds that you hear and sometimes it describes sounds that aren't there. Um, and so I like the idea of that also being sort of slippery in its relationship to what is experienced in the film. And um, that is an imagine, that section is imagining uh, an encounter with this um, hearing aid called an acoustic throne. And it was, um, it was designed for the, a king in Portugal who was hard of hearing. And the arms of the chair become these vessels that collect sound and then feed through a tube to his ear. So I was interested in this chair that I had researched that served um, on multiple levels sort of as a prosthesis. Like it, it literally kind of supports the body as all furniture does and it also, um, sort of upholds his status in society as aristocracy, but it also extends his sensing body. And I think that that line of um, an object that becoming a part of the sensing body or a statue that might have um, seemingly like power beyond its actual material, concrete material constraints, uh, is, was really interesting to me, like how that line can be quite blurry um, so the movie is thinking about cinema in a formal way, but it sort of branches out to these other territories about, I think, just a, uh, a sensorial experience and a relationship of um, uh, environment and objects and bodies, all kind of, um, I don't know, <laughs> living together, maybe? <laughs> No, I mean, in this film, I feel like it really is about, it's like relaying a certain kind of 
sensorial and tactile experience. You know, it's like how how do I relay this this feeling that that I have when I, you know. And it's not. I don't know. I mean, like I always feel like a film can operate or should operate on an effective level, right? You just experience it, you encounter these images and these sounds, and then maybe upon repeat viewings, like there's a little bit more of um, an unfolding of some of these of these specific points of research, or you know, maybe then you'll notice some of these callbacks to these different objects or sounds. Um, but I feel like this film is very, maybe cryptic, but still kind of open, and I'm okay with a viewer having an encounter with it in a very um, unrestricted sense. But the, maybe the one play with subjectivity is when the camera sort of floats around uh, the chair in the final section, the, the acoustic throne, and it, it, it enters into the arm. So I think for that part, I was thinking about the camera, which is so often attached to, you know, just obviously the eye, um, like like attaching the camera to sound and like and sort of reimagining that relationship of identification um, through a lens, right? We get to actually sort of, you know, it's it's drag or it's a pretend, but we get to embody the experience of sound.